Good evening. Tonight's story is the ridiculous Irish fable of The Quare Gander by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. Le Fanu, of course, is most famous for his gothic ghost stories, so this fun little romp written in the local dialect is quite a departure from his reputation. This story was written at the very beginning of his career, originally published in the Dublin University Magazine in 1840. However, I am reading the version published in the Irish Fairy Book in 1909. This version skips the introduction, in which our narrator is out for a walk in the country, and then meets a local rustic who tells them the tale of the Quare Gander. This setup doesn't add anything to the story, and it has some weird moralizing. I agree with our editor, Alfred Percival Graves, who left it out. One more thing. Although it is mentioned in the text, the point is fleeting, and it's possible to miss it, especially with my rendition of the Irish accent, so I just want to make it crystal clear up front that our hero, Terence Mooney, is named after his father. And with that, let's open our imaginations and begin. Terence Mooney was an honest boy and well-to-do, and he rented the biggest farm in this side of the Galtius, and being mighty cute and severe worker, it was small wonder that he turned a good penny every harvest. But, unluckily, he was blessed with an elegant large family of daughters, and of course his heart was almost broke striving to make up fortunes for the whole of them, and there wasn't a contrivance of any sort or description for making money out of the farm that he was up to. Well, among the other ways he had of getting up in the world, he always kept a power of turkeys and all sorts of poultry, and he was out of all reason partial to geese. And small blame to him for that same, for twice a year you can pluck him as bare as my hand, and you get a fine price for the feathers, and plenty of real sizable eggs, and when they are too old to lay any more, you can kill him and sell him to the gentleman for goslings, do you see, let alone that the goose is the most manly bird that is out. Well, it happened in the course of time that one old gander took a wonderful liking to Terence and divil a place he could go serenading about the farm or looking after the men, but the gander would be at his heels and rubbing himself like in his legs and looking up at his face just like any other Christian would do. And Becora, the likes of it were never seen, Terence Mooney and the gander were so great. And at last the bird was so engaging that Terence would not allow it to be plucked any more, and kept it from that time out for love and affection, just all as one like one of his children. But happiness and perfection never lasts long, and the neighbours begin to suspect the nature of the intentions of the gander, and some of them said it was the devil, and more of them that it was a fairy. Well, Terence could not but hear something of what was saying, and you may be sure he was not altogether easy in his mind about it, for from one day to another he was getting more uncomfortable in himself, until he determined to send for Ger Garvin, the fairy doctor, in Gary Owen, and it's he was the elegant hand at the business, and devil of spirit would say a crass word to him, no more nor a priest. And, moreover, he was very great with Oud Terence Mooney, this man's father that was. So, without more about it, he was sent for, and sure enough the devil along he was about it, for he came back that very evening along with the boy that was sent for him, and as soon as he was there, and took his supper, and was done talking for a while, he began, of course, to look into the gander. Well, he turned it this way and that way, to the right and to the left, and straightways and upside down, and when he was tired handling it, says he to Terence Mooney, Terence, says he, you must remove the bird into the next room, says he, and put a petticoat, says he, or any other conveyance around his head, says he. And why so, says Terence. Because, says Ger, says he. Because what, says Terence. Because, says Ger, if it isn't done you'll never be easy again, says he, or pusillanimous in your mind, says he, so ask no more questions but do my bidding, says he. Well, says Terence, have your own way, says he. And with that he took the old gander and give it to one of the gossens. Then take care, says he, don't smother the crater, says he. Well, as soon as the bird was gone, says Ger Garvin, says he, do you know what that old gander is, Terence Mooney? Devil a taste, says Terence. Well then, says Ger, 
The gander is your own father, says he. It's joking, you are, says Terence, turning mighty pale. How can an old gander be my father, says he. I'm not funning you at all, says Ter. It's true what I tell you. It's your father's wandering soul, says he, that's naturally took possession of the old gander's body, says he. I know him many ways, and I wonder, says he, you did not know the cock of his eye yourself, says he. Ah, oh, blur and ages, says Terence. What the devil will I ever do at all at all, says he. It's all over with me, for I plucked him twelve times at the least, says he. That can't be helped now, says Jair. It was a severe act, surely, says he, but it's too late to lament on it now, says he. The only way to prevent what's past, says he, is to put a stop to it before it happens, says he. True for you, says Terence. But how the devil did you come to the knowledge of my father's soul, says he, being in the old candor, says he. If I told you, says Jair, you wouldn't understand me, says he, without book learning and gastronomy, says he. So ask me no questions, says he, and I'll tell you no lies. But believe me in this much, says he, it's your father that's in it, says he, and if I don't make him speak tomorrow morning, says he, I'll give you leave to call me a fool, says he. Say no more, says Terence. That settles the business, says he. And ah, oh, and ages, is it not a queer thing, says he, for a decent, respectable man, says he, to be walking about the country in the shape of an old candor, says he. And oh, murder, murder, is it not often I plucked him, says he, and thunder and arms, might you not have ate him, says he. And with that he fell into a cold perspiration, saving your presence, and on the point of fainting with the bare notions of it. Well, when he was come to himself again, says Jerry to him, quite an easy, Terence, says he, don't be aggravating yourself, says he. For I've a plan composed that'll make him speak out, says he, and tell what in the world he's wanting, says he. And mind and none be coming with your goster and to say again anything that I tell you, says he. But just pretend as soon as the bird is brought back, says he, how that we're going to send him tomorrow morning to market, says he. And if he don't speak tonight, says he, or gather himself out of the place, says he, Put him in the hamper early and send him in the cart, says he, straight to Tipperary to be sold for eighteen, says he, along with the two Gossons, says he. And my name isn't Ger Garvin, says he, if he doesn't speak out before he's halfway, says he. And mind, says he, as soon as ever he says the first word, says he, that very minute bring him off to Father Crotty, says he. And if his reverence doesn't make him retire, says he, like the rest of his parishioners, glory be to God, says he, into the seclusion of the flames of purgatory, says he, then there's no virtue in my terms, says he. Well, with that the old gander was let into the room again, and they all began to talk of sending him the next morning to be sold for roasting in Tipperary, just as if it was a thing undoubtedly settled. But devil a notice the gander took, no more nor if they were speaking to the Lord Liftentart, and Terence desired the boys to get ready the quiche for the poultry, and to settle it out with hay soft and snug, says he, for it's the last jaunt in the poor old gander'll get in this world, says he. Well, as the night was getting late, Terence was growing mighty sorrowful, and downhearted in himself entirely with the notions of what was going to happen. And as soon as the wife and the craters were fairly in bed, he brought out some elegant poutine, and himself and Der Garvin sought down to it, and by Cora, the more uneasy Terence got, the more he drank, and himself and Der Garvin finished a quart between them. It wasn't an imperil, though, and more's the pity, for them wasn't arrived until short since, but devil a much matter it signifies any longer if a pint could hold two quarts, let alone what it does, since Father Matthew, the Lord purloin his reverence, begins to give the pledge, and with the blessing of temperance to degenerate Ireland. And begor, I have the medal myself, and it's proud I am of that same, for abstemiousness is a fine thing, although it's mighty dry. Well, when Terence finished his point, he thought he may as well stop, for enough is as good as a feast says he. And I pity the vagabond, says he, that is not able to control his liquor, says he, and to keep constantly inside of a pint measure, 
says he. And with that, he wished Sir Garvin a good night and walked out of the room. But he went out the wrong door, being a trifle hard in himself and not rightly knowing whether he was standing in his head or his heels or both of them at the same time. And in place of getting into bed, where did he throw himself but into the poultry hamper that the boys had settled out ready for the gander in the morning? And sure enough, he sank down soft and complaint through the hay to the bottom, and with the turning and the rolling about in the night, the devil a bit of him but was covered up as snug as a lumber in a potato furrow before morning. So, with the first light, up gets the two boys that were to take the spirit, as they conceived, to Tipperary, and they caught the old gander up and put him in the hamper and clapped a good wisp of hay on top of him and tied it down strong with a bit of a cord and made the sign of the cross over him and thread in every harem and put the hamper up in the car, wondering all the while what in the world was making the old bird so surprising heavy. Well, they went along quite uneasy toward Tipperary, wishing every minute that some of the neighbours bound the same way it happened to fall in with them, for they didn't half like the notions of having no company but the bewitched gander, and small blame to them for that same. But although they were shaken in their skins in dread of the old bird beginning to converse them every minute, they did not let on to one another, but kept singing and whistling like mad to keep the dread out of their hearts. Well, after they were on the road, better nor half an hour, they came to the bad bit close by Father Crotty's, and there was one devil of a rut three feet deep at the least, and the car got such a wonderful chuck going through it that it wakened Terence within the basket. Bad luck to you, says he. My bones is broke with your tricks. What the devil are you doing with me? Did, did you hear anything, Sadie? says the boy that was next to the car, turning as white as the top of a mushroom. Did you... Did you hear anything queer sounding out of the hamper? says he. No, nor you, says the hiddy, turning pale as himself. It's the old gander that's grunting with the shaking he's getting, says he. Where the devil have you put me into? says Terence inside. Bad luck to your souls, says he. Let me out or I'll be smothered this minute, says he. There's no use in pretending, says the boy. The candor spake and glory be to God, says he. Let me out, you murderers, says Terence. In the name of the Blessed Virgin, says Thady, and of all the holy saints, haunt your tongue, you unnatural gander, says he. Who's that that dare to call me nicknames, says Terence inside, roaring with the fair passion. Let me out, you blasphemous infidels, says he, or by this crass I'll stretch you, says he. In the name of all the blessed saints in heaven, says Thady, who the devil are you? Who the devil would I be but Terence Mooney, says he. It's myself that's in it, ye unmerciful bliggards, says he. Let me out, or by the holy I'll get out in spite of yous, says he. And by jobbers I'll roll up yous in earnest, says he. It's our Terence, sure enough, says Thady. Isn't it cute the fairy doctor found him out, says he. I'm in the pound of snuffocation, says Terence. Let me out, I tell you, and wait till I get at you, says he. For because the devil a bone in your body of a powder, says he. And with that, he began kicking and flinging inside the hamper and driving his legs again the side of it that it was a wonder he didn't knock it to pieces. Well, as soon as the boys seen that, they scalped the old horse into a gallop as hard as he could peg toward the priest's house, through the ruts and over the stones, and you'd see the hamper fairly flying three feet up in the air with the jolting glory be to God. So it was a small wonder, by the time they got to his reverence's door, the breath was fairly knocked out of poor Terence, so that he was lying speechless in the bottom of the hamper. Well... When his reverence came down, they up and told him all that happened, and how they put the gander in the hamper, and how he began to spake, and how he confessed that he was old Terence Mooney, and they axed his owner to advise them how to get rid of the spirit for good and all. So, says his reverence, says he, I'll take my book, says he, and I'll read some real strong holy bits out of it, says he, and do you get a rope and put it round the hamper, says he, and let it swing over the running water at the bridge, says he, and it's no matter if I don't make the spirit come out of it, says he. 
Well, with that, the priest got his horse and took his book in under his arm, and the boys, foiled as reverence, laid in the horse down to the bridge and divil a word out of Terence all the way, for he seen it was no use bacon, and he was afeard that if he made any noise they might trate him to another gallop and finish him entirely. Well, as soon as they were all come to the bridge, the boys took the rope they had with them and made it fast to the top of the hamper and swung it fairly over the bridge, letting it hang in the air about twelve feet out of the water. And his reverend rode down to the bank of the river close by and began to read mighty loud and bold entirely. And when he was going on about five minutes, all at once to the bottom of the hamper came out and down went Terence fall and splash into the water and the old gander atop of him. Down they both went to the bottom with a souse you'd hear half a mile off. And before they had time to rise again, his reverence, with the fair astonishment, gave his horse one dig of his spurs, and before he knew where he was, in he went, horse and all atop of them, and down to the bottom. Up they all came again together, gasping and puffing, and off down with a current with them, like a shot in under the arch of the bridge until they came to the shallow water. The old gander was the first out, and the priest and Terence came next, panting and blowing and more than half drowned, and his reverence was so frightened with the drowning he got, and with the sight of the spirit, as he concerned, that he wasn't the better of it for a month. And as soon as Terence could speak, he swore he'd have the life of the two gossoons, but Father Crotty would not give him his will. And as soon as he was got quieter, they all endeavoured to explain it, but Terence conceived he went early to bed the night before, and his wife said the same to shelter him from the suspicion for having a drop taken. And his reverend said it was a mystery, and swore if he catched anyone laughing at the accident, he'd lay a horse whip across their shoulders. And Terence grew fonder and fonder of the gander every day, until at last he died in a wonderful old age, laving the gander after him and a large family of children. And to this day the farm is rented by one of Terence Mooney's lineal and legitimate post -areas. This story has many excellent sentences, but the best one is, Is it not a queer thing, says he, for a decent, respectable man, says he, to be walking about the country in the shape of an old gander? <laughs> Of course, I love this story. It's cute, it's funny, and everything comes out well in the end. Also, if you were into Irish folk tales about the love between a man and a pet goose, surely an extremely specialized niche in literature, if ever there was one, we happen to have another such story on the channel for you. Check out King O'Toole and St. Kevin, which I will link at the end of the video. I'm surprised that this is the first appearance of Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu on this channel, and I am surprised that this is the first appearance of Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu on the channel. Le Fanu wrote in a number of genres, but is most famous for his gothic horror, and would go on to be a huge influence on writers like Bram Stoker, M. R. James, Henry James, and others. His best-known work today is the lesbian vampire novella Carmilla which was one of the earliest works in vampire fiction and would go on to inspire Bram Stoker's Dracula. Lefanu died of a heart attack at the age of 58. A conservative critic who was warning against the writing of ghost stories said that Lefanu scared himself to death, but there's actually no evidence that that really happened. I'm sure we'll return to his work on the channel in the future. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you'll get to hear me make a confession. This week's confession is that I am really looking forward to Konigstag this year. I'm in a new city where it's a bit more of a celebration, but not quite as chaotic as Amsterdam. I'm actually way more into the market than I am into the festival and the entertainments. I love poking around all the cool old stuff that people try to sell. And the mood is so convivial, it's really a good time. This is also the time of year when there are lots of holidays in the Netherlands. There's Easter and there's King's Day and there's Liberation Day and then down here in Limburg, Pentecost is also a big holiday. Feels like there's something or another every week or two. But it's also really nice to just get out in the springtime and like be out, even if you're not very interested in the king himself. I really hope there's decent weather. If you like kings and geese and everything in between, you should subscribe to this channel. Every week at Restored Lore, I find weird old stories from around the world and I bring them to your feed. Choose notifications so you don't miss anything, and please drop a like on this video to help the channel grow. Thank you so much, and I will see you 
next week.